Hey, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, and David is back again to do apologetics with us. How are you doing, David? I'm hanging in there. It's been a week, but, you know, I'm loving the October weather, and I got my second cup of coffee, so I think things will be okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm hanging on for, uh, for dear life to coffee, too, so uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's do it. Um, so we've been sort of working our way through... Um, pointing out that, that the scriptures uh, not only are the word of God, but stand as historical documents as well, right? Yeah, um, I was kind of thinking about this this morning, and there was one time when I, re- when I moved here to Ohio when I ran across some Mormon missionaries at night, and they, we got in a discussion uh, just on the sidewalk, and, you know, I said, you know, I've, I've looked at the, the evidence for my Christian belief. And I think there's, you know, there's good reasons for it. And they said, well, you know, at some point you just have to have faith. And I looked at them point blank and said, I, I don't buy that. I think that's dangerous. So, you know, I mean, cause if it's a blind faith, you can have blind faith in anything. So I think for me as a, as like an engineer, I got my PhD in like data driven engineering and so i kind of think of my faith as a data driven faith and since christianity is all revolves around the historical person jesus of nazareth if we're going to have a data driven faith about jesus we have to know what's the data and um to do that we have to say what are the sources and again we're looking at this from pure his as pure historians not assuming anything theological or about inspiration and you know obviously the bible are some sources the four gospels we've spent some time on but there are other sources that we've covered like greco-roman authors jewish authors that were non-christian um, christian authors outside the bible Um, And it's important to take a look at the sum total of all the sources and then not just take them point blank, but evaluate them and say, are these reliable sources? Did they have biases? Uh, Were they close to the events? And and same way you would do in a court of law, you don't just trust whatever someone claims in the witness stand, you got to cross-examine. Right. And those aren't unreasonable things, even as Christians, to want to do to the scriptures. It, it's it's not that we don't love the word of the Lord. It's not that we don't trust the word of the Lord. It's that we we trust that it's true so much that we can poke at it a little bit and we're not worried about it breaking. In fact, the more we poke at it, the more we find out it's actually true. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, what one, one clarification I texted you about this, but last time we talked about Lucian and I realized I was putting together two quotes from two different people. Uh, Lucian was one of them, but then I mixed in some facts about another guy. So it actually helps the case because there were two Greco-Roman authors that were saying similar things about people worshiping Jesus, but that corrective note. But yeah, I think, you know, I think we should probably go and maybe finish our survey of what are the early historical sources about Jesus. Sounds good. So it might seem surprising, but the best, most trusted sources, even by skeptical scholars today, for historical information about Jesus are actually not non-Christian authors, not even the Gospels. Um, They're actually the letters of Paul, which is interesting. I mean, that, that makes sense. So the letters of Paul, uh, as Lutherans, we hold real close to them because there's a lot of doctrine. There's great justification stuff. But at the same time, these are letters to a church that is active and living. These are these happening in time and space. They're real parts of history, right? Exactly. Yeah. So these are historical documents and they contain a lot of theological um, statements, which, you know, skeptical non-Christian scholars would obviously not agree with. But as far as sources of information about what people believed about Jesus early on, these things are a gold mine. Um, and so, um, yeah, so let's talk about Paul's letters from a historical perspective rather than a theological perspective. And there are a lot of reasons why Paul is a great source on Jesus and early Christianity. Um, so first, he's early. Um the way the Gospels are typically dated these days, um, they come actually after Paul's Gospel. So our earliest writings of, of, about early Christianity are actually in Paul's letters. And, you know, some scholars outside of Christianity will be skeptical whether Paul wrote all the letters in the Bible, but there is a core that even the skeptical scholars will say, yeah, we're convinced that Paul wrote these and these are authentic. And they're early, they're dated early. They're within a couple decades after Jesus. So the, the closeness in time to the events is important. 
Um, another reason they're important is because he gives eyewitness testimony. Um, we talked about the importance of eyewitnesses a couple of times ago, and Paul lists himself as an eyewitness to Jesus' resurrection, at least Jesus being appearing to him alive after being crucified in 1 Corinthians 15. And we'll come back to that passage when we talk about the resurrection, which is a cool topic unto itself. But Paul also says that he checked his testimony and his message with the other eyewitnesses who lived with Jesus during his life. So Paul was a Pharisee during Jesus' lifetime and wasn't a follower, but the disciples who lived with Jesus during his ministry were preaching the same thing as Paul. Paul says he checked his message with them in Galatians 1 and 2, which is another important passage. Um, another reason Paul is great is because he's honest. When you read his letters and read about the accounts of him from the apostolic fathers one generation after him and from the book of Acts, which has been corroborated by archaeology time and again, it's clear that Paul was extremely passionate about his message in spite of poverty, persecution, and the threat of martyrdom. And so, you know, we talked about who would die for a lie, knowing that it's a lie. And so we have a lot of confidence that Paul is sincere. Another thing, Paul is smart. Even um prominent um, skeptics today will regard Paul as a first-rate philosopher, like he's got a sharp mind, and so he's not someone who's just going to go along with something without thinking about it critically. And then the fifth and final reason why Paul is a great source is he was a hostile skeptic to start out, so he's not someone who is gullible. He had to be convinced. He, he had to be so convinced that he went from persecuting um, Christians to the death because he was convinced they were heretics who were blaspheming God to becoming a great missionary, one of the many early great missionaries of the Christian church. And so um, he, that lack of gullibility shows that maybe he's onto something, or he, at least there's he had good reasons for what he believed. Absolutely. And the, the hostility is something, too, that, that Paul is willing to admit outwardly according to, to his sin. But if you start to read in between the lines, there's actually even a lot more that's sort of um, left there for the reader to understand. So Paul will talk about his persecution of Christians. Like, he'll, he'll repent uh, of, of the harm that he's done towards uh, Christ's people. But when you start to look into the scriptures and see what it is he claims to be and claimed to be before, you, you realize, too, just how much it cost him. So Paul was a Pharisee in good standing. And that's that's something to sort of stay as like he was well respected, but it's also recognizing he was married. If you're a Pharisee in good standing, you're married. Um, if you're a Pharisee in good standing, you are in Jerusalem during the Passover. Paul was more than likely at the crucifixion. Like it, it wasn't just that he was against it later, but it, it was probably that he was from the beginning through it. Um, and Paul talks about being single uh, as well. Um, it, it, it's it's sort of for the reader to understand that somewhere inside of conversion, it, it cost Paul not only his old life but but his old family, um, and, and whether his wife left him or was was put to death early on, uh, we're not really left to to know. But at the same time, when Paul talks about Christianity and admits to being a hostile source, he doesn't quite go into just how much it cost him in a "woe is me" kind of way, but a look at the things that I have done just objectively, and, and from that you can start to see uh, just where he came from and just how much would have had to been shown to him for him to, to then preach the way that he does. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a really good point. That's pretty powerful. That cost of what it, what it cost him. Um, yeah. So uh, lots of reasons why I think Paul is a great source. He's honest, he's smart, he's close to the events, he's early. Um, so, so what's, what do we get from Paul's testimony from a historical perspective? You know, there's a lot of theology, you know, as Protestants, we love Pauline theology, but from a historical perspective, two, what, one thing that's particularly noteworthy is that at the earliest stage of the record that we have on Christianity that's been written down and preserved, Christianity is a supernatural version of Jesus. Jesus is risen from the dead. Paul says he's seen him alive after being crucified. And he also says that he's interacted with other eyewitnesses who saw him alive after he was resurrected. So there's early testimony tied to eyewitnesses that Jesus has risen from the dead. So this is not the stuff of legend. Legend isn't early and it doesn't go, it doesn't tie back to eyewitnesses. Uh, and then 
the other thing that's curious is that Paul is unabashed about calling Jesus God. And this is very curious because as a Pharisee, as a monotheistic Jew, blasphemy is very serious. You know, Jews memorize the, sh- the Shema, Shema, you know, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. So to claim that something was God was very serious. And that's something that he wouldn't have done. I mean, Paul is very clear about how seriously he takes his conscience in his letters. And so for him to be clear in his conscience and say, Jesus is God, that shows, first of all, Jesus is being worshiped as God very early, not just a man, but also Paul had to have had good reasons to say this. He wouldn't have just said this if he was making it up or if there wasn't good reason from Jesus' life and teachings for saying this. And so this there's a supernatural Christianity from the beginning. There's not a story about Jesus just being some kind of a good teacher. And then over time, people started adding in the supernatural stuff about miracles, resurrection, and God. That's there from the beginning. So if you wanted then to to assume that Christianity was just sort of a series of moral teachings, you'd almost be making a logical leap then, right? Yeah. So that's that's interesting because, you know, there's it's popular to say Jesus was just a man and all these supernatural beliefs evolved over time. But if you're going to have a data-driven faith, the data, there's no data of that kind of Christianity. All the data that we have is that Christianity had the supernatural stuff from the beginning. So, you know, if you don't want blind faith, you shouldn't believe in a non-supernatural early Christianity because that that's blind faith there. We have no record of that. You're, you're leaping in the dark at that point. That's, that's a, that's a pretty important point, I think, to kind of carry with us. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean that the claims are true. We haven't got there yet. But it does show that they were there from the beginning and that there was no evolution of Christianity over time. That's that's important to recognize. Yeah. What else we got? Um, so other sources. Um Our last category of sources, if Paul's letters are maybe the best and most trusted, we can get to maybe the least trusted, but they're very controversial. And these are, uh, they're called different things, maybe the Gnostic Gospels, the Apocryphal Gospels, the Sued, what's the word, Pseudepigraphical? Yeah, Pseudepigraphal. Um, Pseudepigraphal. So, yeah, that, that we recognize they're, they're pseudo, they're, they're, they're like, but they're not actually the Gospels. So they're, they're known and confessed forgeries. They're, they're almost like fan fiction for Jesus. Um, <laughs> some of and, them, yeah, some of them, and some of them are definitely just bizarre. Yeah, it gets it's get it gets weird. And so you said apocryphal gospels too. And that's maybe just sort of worth pointing out. Like we're not talking about the Old Testament apocrypha, which which are a series of books like you'll find in a Roman Catholic Bible, but not most uh Protestant Bibles. Uh they're they're sort of those intertestamental books that that we recognize as um as authentic, but but maybe not necessarily um pertinent to Christ and, and him crucified, which is which is what we build the canon around, right? Uh, in part, yeah, I think, you know, the canon, I like to think about it as what's inspired and mm-hmm. the Old Testament Apocrypha, that's a conversation unto itself, but it comes from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures that the Jews were using and then the Christians inherited, you know, a lot of the Jews became Hellenistic or Greek culture after Alexander the Great. And so they said, you know, for common Jews to understand the Bible, we need a Greek translation. And that's where the Septuagint comes from. And they translated a handful of books that are in our um, the Bibles that we use as Protestants in America. But there were other ones in there too. And um, there was a long discussion throughout the Middle Ages about the the Old Testament Apocrypha. But the the consensus, at least among Protestants, is that these books are valuable they're edifying but they're not inspired and so we don't build doctrine on them but they can be interesting sources as as purely historical sources and so that's one category you know we shouldn't you know shun the apocrypha luther put it in his translation of the bible because it was common you know he's he, he put a footnote saying these are not inspired but you know for the sake of tradition uh, you know we're gonna put these in here the new testament when people talk about new testament apocrypha it's something completely different this is something that the early christians while they accepted the old testament apocrypha as part of the septuagint 
they were very careful when the New Testament books were being written to distinguish between three categories. There were the categories that were definitely apostolic and true. Um, and there was a core of these early on. Paul's letters and the four gospels and acts were you know, recognized almost immediately as inspired and authoritative. Um, and then there was a category that was edifying, but not inspired. And so, you know, the, the, the epistle or the, um, there's a book by Barnabas, um, or it's attributed to Barnabas that's, or the shepherd of Hermas or, um, all these kinds of things They're they're useful. They're written by sincere Christians and they're edifying. I mean, it's great reading them. They're, they make for good devotional material, but they're not inspired. And then there's the third category, which is these are forgeries. They don't carry authority. They, they're not tied to the eyewitnesses. They're teaching things that are contrary to the eyewitnesses. And therefore, we're not even going to allow them to be read in church because they're just, they're just full of you know, stuff that's not helpful. Right. So it's important to recognize just how early Christianity started to fracture, that John is actually writing against a group of people called Gnostics, even while he's penning his gospel, uh, that that almost right away, there was a, a group of Christians who sort of broke away from the teachings of Jesus and, and said that, you know, everything of the world is bad. Everything spiritually is good. Um, and they, they would sort of let the two war, it, not letting Jesus physically rise from the dead, which is, again, kind of important to our religion. Um but they, to, to sort of gain credibility, they would sort of assume biblical names um, and, and write gospels under them. Uh, and, and so we have uh, supposed gospels from Thomas and Barnabas and Mary Magdalene and Judas, and these would teach very differently than the rest of Christianity um, and, and also be recognized by almost nobody during the time as, as worthwhile, right? Yeah, so it's popular today for... Um... So for there to be theories that, you know, Christianity was diverse at the beginning. There were all these competing theories, the Gnostic version, the version that's come to be considered mainstream Christianity today, all these versions of Christianity. And there was a bunch of controversy about what Jesus really said. And we really don't know what the right version of Christianity was because um, it was basically politics that won the day, not anything to do with truth. Um, and, and the history was written by the winners. That's the theory. And then, you know, part of that theory is that there was this version of Christianity early on, which included Jesus as just a man and not God. And so we need to kind of unwrap all this history to discover the true Christianity. You know, that's the claim. Well, how do we respond to it? So, um, yeah, a couple a couple points. Um, problems with the non-canonical gospels, the gospels that aren't in the Bible, that they're pretty much recognized as unreliable historical sources. They don't give a lot of useful information about what Jesus actually said and did. And even skeptical scholars see this. And um, and there are reasons, there are good reasons for this. So the canonical gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're always tying their events in real places with real historical events, historical figures. They've been corroborated to describe climate and geography very well. So they're rooted in kind of the real world. The narrative takes place in a setting that's real. Um, in contrast, a lot of these other gospels outside the Bible are just conversations or teachings that just kind of happened in a vacuum. Um, and so it's hard to corroborate them as actually having happened because they don't tie back to verifiable history. Uh, another problem with them is that um, the we talked about the apostolic fathers last time and the generation of Christians after the apostles. And they were clear that the apostles were unanimous and public in their teaching. So if someone said, you know, well, Peter said that Jesus was actually a Greek demigod, you know, because the apostles testimony was unanimous and public, people would know whether that was the true or not. So it's kind of like if, if someone comes on the news and said, you know, yesterday, President Biden declared war on, you know, whatever country, you know, if that hadn't happened, everybody would be like, where's he getting this? You know, and so and so these these other gospels, a lot of them are presented not as public unanimous testimony of the apostles, but as secret teachings from Jesus to a select apostle. And now this teaching is only now coming to light years after the fact. So it's a little bit suspicious, you know. It, 
Uh, it goes against you know, what everybody knew to be true. Um, another reason is that these gospels typically portray Jesus in a way that contradicts his Jewish context. So most of our sources will say Jesus was a Jew. He believed Jewish things. He taught Jewish things. When you read these other gospels, they don't sound anything like Jewish monotheism. They don't sound anything like atheism. They don't sound like any kind of worldview recognizable today. It's it's really weird. You have, you know, the sky and the earth giving birth to all these things. And it's, it sounds more like Greek mythology. So it just doesn't fit the context of what we know about Jesus. And then finally, you know, to the to the point that Jesus was maybe just a man, the interesting thing is that the most human version of Jesus is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These other gospels tend to portray Jesus as less human and emphasize his divine nature. So even if these gospels are real, they do a lot more to elevate the supernatural aspect of Jesus than any natural part of him. So yeah, when we when we start to sit through with these, we can say if, if nobody then at the time took them seriously, for us to take them seriously, that again sounds like kind of a blind leap of faith. A little bit, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I I've heard it said that if you want to see whether these gospels have anything useful to say about Jesus, you should just read them, um, and that'll convince you that they're not. Um, and so maybe that's a, a good closing thought is, you know, one of the best things you can do when you're researching your faith to see if it stands on solid ground is fact check the clickbait. If someone says the Gospel of Thomas is a new source, secrets about Jesus just now revealed, Christians hate this, you know, read the Gospel of Thomas and see what it says. And you'll see that it was anti-women and just had some weird things to say, and it just doesn't fit with what we know about Jesus. So, I mean, do your homework, you know, look at the actual sources and not just what people are claiming about the sources. Great. That's a great point. David, thanks so much for joining us today in the Drive to School. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. Have a good one. You too.